think something that's important um, as believers to realize is a lot of times we have like a goal. We see someone that's like a role model and we see the destination, but we, we don't understand the process from A to B, how it took, from where they were at to, to where, they're, where they are. One time we were in Nashville and we were leading worship at a conference and Bill was the speaker and we had a really long day with the kids and they were sick and just a long day. And we were getting ready to lead worship and we're in the car driving to the event and uh, Bill's in the back seat and I'm in the front seat. And uh, I just kind of mumbled under my breath, mommy hat off, worship hat on, you know, just kind of getting myself in the mood or whatever, I guess. And um, Bill just leaned into the front seat and simply said, um, the problem is, is that the worship hat should have never come off. And that one phrase kind of became my whole life with no matter what I do, if I'm changing diapers or being mom or up on a stage in front of like a lot of people that that, that hat doesn't come off and that it stays the same. When I was seven years old, um, I was sitting in a small group of kids and our, our, our leader, Sunday school leader or whatever was um, leading us in worship. And you know, I grew up in the, I grew up under the pew. I'm a PK, and I understand um, a lot of the Bible stories and I understand the concepts of worship. But until that day, did I not really understand the power of worship and why we worship and the, all the facets of of the depths of what worship and what praise is. And I'm sitting in this group of kids, and um, all of a sudden, literally out of nowhere. I know what it is now, but a, a, a demon, an evil spirit, either sat on my shoulders or came close to me, I don't know how, whatever, and I, I literally, that spirit of terror came on me, and I lost it. And I ran to the bathroom, because um, I didn't want to go cry, you know, like cry and stuff in front of the, the, the other kids in the room, and I, I looked at my eyes in the bathroom like, what, what is going on? And I'm just panicking, and I'm freaking out, and I ran home that day, didn't talk to anyone. I just ran home. And we lived in a small town in Weaverville. It's 4,000 people. So it wasn't a huge, like a city, but it's still, you know, it's a 15 minute walk running home. And, and I, I'm trying, as I'm on my way home, I'm trying to figure out what is going on. And I knew enough to know that, you know, this is not right. This is not God. What is happening? So I get home and I just, free, I'm telling my parents and that, you know, and then I started to go through a process with my dad. So I get, I get home, I'm telling my parents, you know, what's going on, and my dad starts to teach me and train me from that day on all the way through high school until I was 21. I mean, I slept with my parents almost every night until I was 18 years old. And because of this torment that I was going through, and it was off and on, it wasn't all the time, and I was a Christian. And I, I can remember as a kid, you know, laying in bed with my parents, and literally, I remember one time where this thing is on and my dad's teaching me, we're singing and praising in the bed and I'm feeling this attack, this terror, you know, and I, I was like on the verge of, of losing it and, and, and anyways, and I, we're just singing, you know, I love you, Lord, and we exalt thee and all, these, all the songs that you can sing without an instrument, which by the way, all you guys that wrote those songs, thank you so much. We sat in bed and I remember from 12 at night to six in the morning straight, And I remember, you know, it came in waves that night. I remember um, about six in the morning as we're worshiping, singing like we exalt thee or something. It broke. You know, it, it wasn't through prayer. It wasn't through reading the Bible. It wasn't through anything. It wasn't even through processing through it. It was, it was purely... <laughs> just singing, singing to the Lord. I remember six in the morning after this battle, my dad looks at me and says, you did it. You know, a lot, a lot of, you know, there's some parenting here too, like training your kids to fight, you know, training, training your kids to, to do that, to battle, to, to learn what it is, to learn spiritual principles, to learn what it is to, to praise, what it is to worship. I think right now, is the most relevant encounter that I've ever had in worship. And so I want to tell you that, like, even just in the last month, um, losing one of my best friends, 
of 12 years, um, he passed away. And if I have ever offered a sacrifice of praise, it's right now. You know, like you're singing songs about the dead being raised and the blind seeing, and you're um, singing about a good God. And, and my, you know, my best friend still died. He didn't come back and he didn't get raised from the dead, but I get to stand up and I still get to declare and worship. And I remember the first time I led a worship the weekend after I got back and I thought I was going to pass out because it was like everything inside of me. And I just closed my eyes and I said, God, I know. I know that you're good, and I know that your character is the same, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you are the same God, and so I choose you, and I choose to stay hungry, I choose to, to want you, I choose to desire you, you know, I turn my affections towards you, and even though you didn't answer the way I thought you would, you're still the God I fell in love with, you are still that God, and I think that I think that my most incredible encounters, without getting too specific in worship, are the moments when you realize that this is not about getting something back. This is about an expression of love. This is about not withholding your love from a God who's been good, who's never let you down. And so no matter what's taking place, regardless of my heart feeling like it's broken some right now, I cannot hold back from him because he's always been good and he's always the same. So I think right now that's, that's the biggest for me. I could hardly stand up that night, I think. Like just hardly stand up. And all I can say is, I, I trust you, I know you, I, I love you, and you're still the same, and I'm still with you, no matter what, I'm with you. I can remember a time when I was probably about 16, and I was laying on the floor by the coffee table. We, we lived out in the woods at that time. And um, I remember laying, we had this great big doors, these great big windows in the house. And we lived in the woods and there were just mountains and trees. It was this incredible place. And I was laying there looking at the stars and, and I started to, I literally heard, heard this voice, you know, um, started to tell me all these lies and that, that thing, terror came on me. But I remember I had a choice. You can run upstairs and tell your dad and your mom what's going on and then, you know, they're going to help you through this and you'll worship. You know, and I knew the process. We did it every night. But I, I chose, I said, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do what my dad has taught me to do. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay down here as an act of faith. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to face this thing head on. I remember I just started worshiping on my own, 16 years old. And, um, you know, Chris Valentin, one of our pastors, says this. He said when he was going through a difficult time in his life, he put a chair out in front of him and he sat in a chair and he said, devil, Come over here right now. I want you to sit in this chair, and here's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to praise my God as loud and as long as I'm, I can, and you're going to sit there and you're going to watch me. And that's what I did that night. I just started praising God, you know, on my own. I didn't, I didn't want someone to help me out this time. I'm like, I'm going to do. I'm going to. I'm going to learn this for myself. I'm going to. I'm going to encounter. This God, you know, my parents tell me about, basically. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is a step of faith. And I'll tell you what happened. The Lord literally, almost audibly spoke a verse to me in the Bible as I'm worshiping. And I think this is a key for people to realize, like, we need, like David said, we need to learn to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. There's nothing wrong with getting help from other people, but when we learn to strengthen ourselves in the Lord, it's a real part, key part of life. And I remember the Lord spoke to me this verse, man, and I'm telling you, it was incredible. It was almost audible, and I opened the Psalms up, and it was literally word for word what I was going through. You know, the pangs of, of Sheol laid a hold of me, the death of the torment of the grave laid upon me. I was overcome, and then I cried out to you. I called upon your name, and you rescued me. You reached down in the pit and pulled me out. And it was incredible because at that moment when the Lord spoke that, that verse and I read it, that thing broke like that because we, I'd stepped out in that faith. God spoke his word, and that thing broke. And from that day on, um, it felt like the, like the Lord handed me a key, you know, to, to, to battle this thing. And, and then from that, you know, we started street ministries. And, I mean, we saw so many people get set free on the street from drugs, from, from uh, addictions, from demonization. And, um, you know, this, this thing about praise, the power of praise, it's so important. You know, King Jehoshaphat, when he went out to battle that day and he says, we're not going to go out with swords and spears. We're going to go out with our instruments. 
We're going to praise this God who says he's going to deliver us. And I tell you what, God, all God wants is he wants us to fall in love with him, to, to keep our passion alive, to obey him, to become friends with him. And literally, I believe he literally will take care of the rest for us. Any time in my life that I've gone through something and uh, came out the other side of it, I realized that in the midst of whatever it was that I was going through, His presence beside me, in me, around me, is the sustaining force on my life. Ezekiel 37, the chapter before, I was hit so hard with that because when I was 18 and I was questioning God, you know, what is the calling on my life? What is it that you want me to do? What am I here for? I know it's not just, I know it's not limited to music. I love music. It's my expression, but it's not, that's not the whole of it. And, and he brought me to that passage, Ezekiel 37, the valley of the dry bones where the servant, you know, asks the Lord, like, what should I, what should I speak over these bones? And God gives him a word and says, prophesy to the four winds. And he watches as breath, the breath of God enters these bones and they stand up to their feet. And I remember sobbing in my dad's truck, reading that passage of scripture and saying, God, I want to be that servant. I want to be the person who you give a song to of your promise to sing over anyone who's dry, anyone who's dead, anyone who feels like they're ashes, anyone who feels like their heart isn't beating, they're not alive, they're not truly alive. And I want to witness your life enter them so they can stand up to their feet in their true identity and become exactly who they are called to be. And so Throughout the years, I mean, God has consistently brought me back to that scripture. Whenever someone seems to have a prophetic word for me, it would be, you know, does Ezekiel 37 mean anything to you? I just am really feeling this. And so that's why I was hit so strongly just a moment ago, you know, just a reminder of like that, that is, if I were to say what I feel called to, that's what I'm called to. It's just be in the presence of God so closely and get rid of everything else that could distract me from hearing his voice so that in the moment he whispers something to me like sing sing about my peace then that can be released over anyone who's feeling anxious or anyone who's feeling depressed or anyone who's feeling unsure or confused the peace of God will enter the room and cancel that out I was teaching on a Friday night in Dallas and uh, I, I just led in a chorus afterwards. I, I just wanted us to give a moment of thanks to the Lord. And the presence just began to fill that place. There was such a glory that began to hover. And it's a healing conference and it's a healing meeting and there's sick people all over the room that are needing a miracle. And so I've got this divided heart because I absolutely want to honor the presence of the Lord above everything else. But I also feel this pull and need to pray for folks. So I, I led in this chorus, and the anointing just came, just like increased so dramatically that I had to lead in another one and another one. And it was like 30 minutes, I don't know how much longer later, I finally realized we're not praying for the sick tonight, even though it's a healing meeting, because the, the presence of the Lord is so strong that I'm not going to violate that to do something that I think would be a good idea. And, uh, and this went on for quite a while. And then finally, the Lord reminded me, He reminded me, when I walked into the building that night, I heard the word deafness, deafness. And when he reminded me of that, I knew he just gave me permission, even though I laid down the right to pray for the sick. He just gave me permission to pray for the sick. So I called out, everybody who has loss of hearing, raise your hand, some were totally deaf, severed auditory nerve to various kinds of levels of damage of hearing. They raised their hands and in, in just minutes, 82 people were healed of deafness. And that happened out of a worship encounter. You know, I, I first began to discover the, the power of worship at, at a pretty young age. <clears throat> I, um, I think it was like, oh, six to eight years old, uh, some of my earliest memories. And I used to have these terrible nightmares. Like they were just, um, I don't know, they felt, felt really demonic sometimes. And, um, and I, I began to discover all by myself, my parents didn't even tell me to do this, but, but at night when, when, when that fear, the fear of falling asleep would, would kind of come over me before, before I would actually fall asleep, <laughs> I, uh, 
I would just begin to sing worship songs. I remember singing, I love you, Lord, you know that, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. And I just begin to sing that over and over and over and over again to myself. And I just felt like the peace of God just uh, like descend on me. And, and I just realized, you know, that was one of my first discoveries of there's something really, really powerful about worship. And, and, you know, ever since then, it's just been, you know, kind of growing. All, my most powerful times and encounters with the Lord have always, always been in times of, of worship and, and, and prayer before Him. I can remember when I was, I turned 21 and I was just, we, me and Jen were just about to get married and I had one more trip and we were flying to Georgia. And it was me and my mom and, you know, um, I was really scared, like elevators. I didn't like to get in elevators and um, small planes, just that claustrophobic feeling. And, Man, I, I get, I, it, for a week I talked myself in, I said, okay, I'm going to get on this plane and, and uh, I can do it, you know, I can do it. And this is when I was, I was just, I was really, you know, I was really going through it. So I was, I was gearing myself up for this trip, you know, and, and it's a small plane. You know, if you've ever been in a small plane, they stuck us in the far back and I'm in this small little, we call them pole jumpers and, and I'm okay, oh, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And, um, and uh, cause the fear was, my biggest fear was that I was going to lose control of my body, I was gonna lose control of my mind and I wasn't gonna be able to control myself because I've had those experiences before where I felt like I was totally losing control. And it's just, it's terrible. So I'm, I'm going through this thing and I get in the plane, they shut the door and it started, it hit me, man. I started losing it, crying and I was laying in my mom's, I'm 21 and I'm laying in my mom's lap and I'm crying and and I'm, I'm it's, and my mom hands me the Bible, Psalms 91 and I knew from the, the, the experience I had with my parents, Praise is what breaks that heavy yoke. Praise is what brings victory. So I turned to Psalms 149 and on the plane, so help me God, the poor lady next to me, uh, I don't know what she thought, but I didn't care. At that moment, I was like, I'm either gonna, you know. Anyway, so I start singing out Psalms 149 on the plane. And um, it was a, like a 45 minute flight. And 15 minutes before we landed, it was the most incredible thing. I literally almost heard the voice of the Lord audibly and the Lord said, it, 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 in an instant, it broke. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I've, you know, I've given you the keys to this thing and I want, you to, I want you to spread this around. I want you to teach other people the power of praise, the, the process of praise. And man, I broke out into tears. I'm telling you, it was like the most amazing moment in my entire life because I'd went through from seven to 21 off and on this, these seasons of, 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 of process and torment and stuff. And at that moment, the Lord said, I've, you've got the keys, you know, and I was set free from, and I've never had an experience like that since that day.